wants to know what's your what, what, what's your story. What's up, my friends? Jason Woodland back once again with Always the Journey TV. Uh, today we are representing episode number seventy. So again, thank you so much for joining us. I sincerely appreciate you dedicating your time uh, to watching these shows and these amazing interviews with these great people out here in the community to learn more about everything they've got going on, uh, whether it's their businesses, their jobs, their artwork, their event spaces, their nonprofit organizations, uh, music, art, the whole nine yards. Uh, I love to talk to everybody and to learn about uh, their path, their process, their journey, and thus the name Always the Journey. Uh, so anyway, today I'm extremely excited about introducing to you uh, a dear friend. His name is Brian Higgins, uh, hailing from Northern Ireland, incorporating film, stand-up comedy, uh, visual arts, and events, uh, creating uh, a community through creative uh, communication. Uh, Brian Higgins is using aspects of film and creative expression to help end stigma in mental health, a phenomenally important endeavor. Uh, Higgins is the founder and creative director of Mental Healthy Fit, uh, inspiring and motivating acceptance of mental health issues by making things better for people all around. Uh, friends, please allow me to introduce to you my inspiring friend, Brian Higgins. Uh, what's happening, my friend? Wonderful to be here. Thanks. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. I am very glad uh, that you've been able to, to dedicate some time to be with us today. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, Brian, uh, I mean, you've got an amazing history. You've done all kinds of wonderful stuff out here in the community. Um, I know that um, uh, you're, you're well known in town, but for the people that either don't know you or want to learn a little bit more. So you're from Ireland. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, that experience? Uh, well, I'm actually from Northern Ireland. Northern uh, Ireland. I, I yes. do apologize. <laughs> no, not to worry. Not to worry. It's interesting, you know. It, it, it I, I'm not going to say obviously, but uh, Northern Ireland is is a different country than Ireland, and a lot of people uh, sort of uh, trip over that. And it is part of the UK, but again, because of the the difficulties and the the trials and tribulations of the past, and it's it's interesting. Just an anecdote, because a lot of people will say, "Hey, uh, you're Irish, whatever." And and back in the days, we'll get more into my story, but I used to get a lot more. You know, agitated about that, and say, ah, I'm from Northern Ireland. Da, da, da. But all it would do was just make people, you know, more contentious about it. And uh, and I, so I, you know, I understand. You know, a lot of people, you know, were just being interested to to want to be my friend and stuff like that. But but on the side aspect is when I moved to Utah, and I would you know talk to people. People would think that I was from Australia, you know, with the accent. Somehow I never see it like, but or hear it. But they'd say I'm from Australia. And I would joke and say, "What are you saying? I'm from New Zealand." And then they would they would be so apologetic. They say, "Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. What can I? I didn't really mean to offend you." And I'm like, "Well, why does that not happen when when I say I'm from Northern Ireland instead of Ireland? You know, it's yeah. Somehow somehow they're so freaked out about the New Zealand versus Australia <laughs> element, but uh, but that's just something that 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 comes along. So. But yeah, yeah, well, so I think Northern it's good that you, uh, that you teach people so people can make sure that um, they're saying the right thing. So I think that's that's great. So so Northern Ireland, what yeah, was that it, experience like? It's also and, and just when you when you say that, you know, it's interesting because it is education, you know, and whether or not whatever side of the the divide that you land on, whether it's Ireland, Northern Ireland, Republican, Democrat, whatever, you know, it's still education and you should still be conscious of of not not offending someone else and and we can kind of look at the whole like uh, misgendering people nowadays you know and it's if you if you don't know it's 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 better not it's better to ask you know and say hey uh, i i'm unaware but what what are your pronouns you know and, and people tell you rather than sort of tripping up and you know maybe you know uh, unconsciously uh, uh, offending somebody. So it's if you don't know something, always ask because you know people will be more inclined to to give you the right answer that that yep. that that applies to them. And especially nowadays, you know, when everyone's running around, you know, so well, I I can say what I what I what I want, you know. But it's still you know be conscious of other people, you know. Yeah. So, but but yeah. So uh, long <laughs> a lot of like tiptoeing and, and circumnavigating your question but you know growing up in northern ireland 
you know, if people aren't aware, there was the difficulties with the the terrorist activities with the IRA and uh, uh, and all of that. And you know, it doesn't really hit the news as much as it used to. But but back in my days in the in the late seventies and eighties, it was really rife, and and it was pretty much whatever whatever the difficulties were. You know, it were it was world news. You know, back then, and so it was a. Uh, I have to say it was my childhood and, and I had a great time, but, you know, obviously there was difficulties, uh, extenuating circumstances that I that I had to deal with, um, which I didn't really deal with until my later life, <laughs> you know, once the, the old post-traumatic stress and everything from the violence uh, and the trauma started arising. But, you know, you know, growing up, uh, it was a... It, you know, it was, it was it was a great time. Uh, you know, and I have to laugh and joke that, like, I'm a I'm a fella, and you know, I'm sure many fellas around the world, you know, love playing army. You know, getting out there and getting a stick, you know, and and run through the forest pretending that you're you're playing army, whereas I just got to play army for real. <laughs> you know, uh, so you know. So when you say when you got to play army for real. Uh, would, would you mind expanding on that a little bit if you're comfortable doing so? Sure. Uh, you know, just because the, the, you know, there were soldiers on the streets, there was checkpoints, there was, uh, you know, there was a, uh, bombs going off every day. And, and yeah, it's, it's so, it's hard to sort of, because I, I'm so far removed from it now, but, you know, it was 26 years of my life living like that. And, you know, I have to think about what's going on in Ukraine and and all, even during the time that I was experiencing that trauma, you know, there was, there was, there was similar traumas, a lot worse, you know, all around the rest of the world, you know, happening that just, just weren't getting the spotlight. So, you know, my story is no different than millions of others and but as far as like for, for playing army, you know, it was just, you know, there was real life, like it was live action role playing, so to speak, you know, LARPing, <laughs> you know, just, but we had the real, the real, you know, soldiers around that you just had to deal with getting a, a, a checkpoint or getting through and like even to go shopping, you know, you had to get searched, um, you couldn't even get into the into Belfast. Uh, you couldn't even drive into Belfast. You had to stop like out on the outskirts, and then you had to get in a bus. And the bus would take you in, and then the dogs would get on and sniff for bombs. Then you get off the, the bus, and you'd have to go through this military checkpoint and everything, and just to go shopping. And, and my very first job, uh, well, my very first job was a paper boy, but my first uh, like part time job, I worked in a clothing shop. And one of my duties was, you know, at the end of the day to um, to pat down all the clothes for fire bombs because people would come in and try on a pair of jeans or a jacket, whatever, and they'd put a, a you know, a very rudimentary uh, incendiary device in the pocket. They'd hang it back up on the, on the rack and then it would be on a timer. Uh, and then once the shops closed, it would, it would, you know, it would just burst into flames and then it would just set up, set the whole uh shop on fire so um but i just remember that and it was just one of the things you do hey gotta gotta do this quickly because i gotta get out gotta get home go and mess around with my mates you know and it's just you're just you just it's just second nature so wow gosh i mean that's going to definitely create a lot of trauma in a, in a young mind and you said that you uh that you lived there until you were 26 years old did i hear that yeah. correctly yeah yep yeah. And uh, what portion of that time was uh, going through those types of experiences? Uh, the entire time. Uh, well, y y the entire time, I would say, like the peace process um, happened when I was uh, 93 or 96, 90, maybe 93 or 96. Uh, you know, you can fact check this, but, uh, um, but the peace process started and the ceasefire started, you know, and it was and there was supposedly peace uh but there really wasn't you know it just meant there were still dissident groups that were still doing the thing hey we're talking like 90 percent of the country wanted peace um so they all go in and you had to and it was you had to go in and 
and vote yes or no. That was it. It was simple. Do you want peace, yes or no, on the little card? And um, and then, you know, so so 90% say, yeah, okay, we want peace. But then you've still got 10% say so no. So that 10%, just because, you know, it gets – it gets passed down. It's like, oh, yeah, there's a ceasefire now, you know, and all of the the terrorist groups are are disbanded, but you've still got ten percent that still want to, you know, create havoc. So then they created their own, you know, spin off groups, um, um, and then they can continue to do it, you know. So it was still just as just as you know rife as as was before. Um, so and you know I I had more of a, a difficulty with it because because you know we had a, a military family and my my dad was chief inspector of the police, so we were targeted for that you know so there was a lot more uh, elements around my upbringing and around that 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 a normal person you know a normal person obviously would have been would have been aware of the situation and and being you know, being involved, like seeing bombings, you know, and just peripherally, but as far as being directly targeted or directly like hypervigilant within it, um, it may, it may not have been the case. So. Wow. Um, if you don't mind me asking, did you, did you see anything that uh, directly targeted you and your family because of that situation you were in? Yeah. Yeah. There, you know, there's the multiple occasions. You know, and there's there's multiple occasions that I was directly uh, involved in, directly connected to, like from being four years old, you know, all the way up to, um, you know, 26 when I left. And then, but then there's there's tons of stuff that I just never knew. Um, that was just, you know, as a child, you know, you're you're sort of hidden from it, you're protected from it. So I don't know it's only really been my my adult life that, you know, I've I've had more connection and more, more integration, and that's interesting from a PTSD element because, of course, I, I suffer from PTSD. Um, so situations in my memory of how I perceive that these things happened, um, but then when I hear the perspective and the storyline from someone else that was involved, that reveals you know more to the story that I'm completely unaware of you know then it just it it's like a, a what's the, uh, an unreliable nar narrator unreliable narrator mm -hmm. you know and then you suddenly think wow it's it's like watching a film you know that that at the end of the film when all of the the things are revealed you know say say i'm well for the sake of sixth sense you know without any spoiler well we can talk about spoilers because it's like 30 odd years old yeah but you know you watch the sixth sense the first time and when the reveal comes you're like completely blown away mm -hmm. um but then on consequent watches you know you can tell oh, this is this is obvious that this is what's happening and here's all the little easter eggs placed through that you can follow the trail um and that's kind of what my my life is you know it's just difficulties of of trying to understand you know situations and, and be conscious of, of those from 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 new perspectives you know so. yeah exactly um that's that's got to be uh, really challenging especially as a youth when you only have what you understand in your in your vision you don't understand all those other sort of nuances and the the entire part of the story so that could have a really dramatic uh, and traumatic impact uh, on you as as a youth um thus creating that sort of uh, ptsd mm-hmm Wow. Um, what so so obviously you finished high school there. Um, was was did, did you get a, a full experience uh, within high school? Were you able to go, or were there periods of time where you weren't able to go? Like, what did that look like? And, uh, no, it was, you know we like the childhood was was perfectly fine, and going to going to school was perfectly fine. You know they like. It's a silly thing. Like I was doing my exams one day, and uh, you know, I I don't like laughing at this and smiling. It's just a it's just a a coping mechanism. You know, it's anything you look back and think 
you know, how ridiculous was this situation? But, you know, you do your exams. I don't know how they do them in America, but everyone gets put in the gym, you know? Everyone has to do their exam in the same space. Mm -hmm. And this is basically high school diploma, GCSEs, uh, General Certificate of Secondary Education. And we were in the, in the, in the gym doing our exams and a fella came in with a makeshift flamethrower and set the place on fire and um you know and and it's just one of those things like you're you know with my name higgins um i was just a couple of rows it was all alphabetical so i was like just about i was just about of reach of the flamethrower um, <clears throat> so what so yeah, you're in there um, taking a test and someone walks in with a flamethrower and, yeah. and starts using it. Sure. But, you know, that guy, the guy, he, um, and he made the flamethrower himself out of a, out of a fire extinguisher for, for all things, you know, and he was, uh, that wasn't specifically about the, the troubles, you know, it was, you know, a great, it, it, you know, it's just like anyone who's got a grudge is going to do something. And, um, but, you know, those, those, those things or, or like the, you know, just across the board, just multiple, multiple things that, you know, it just happened. But, I, you know, I've got, I've got hundreds of stories. Are there any that you feel like you'd be, be comfortable expanding on or? Um, it would really, I would have to be, I would need to get a kernel, you know, I, that's the way my storytelling works is because there's so many, um, it, it sort of comes up in conversation when, when somebody would, would mention something like, oh, I tell you what, you know, just as we said about like finding fire bombs in the clothes or doing, you know, it's, um, yeah, did you just, have any close calls sure you know multiple stuff that you'll just never know about you know just like those things you know hey if i didn't if my shoelace wasn't untied that day i would have already been walking across the road and get hit by the car but is that fate or is it whatever is it just chaos you know so there's a lot of times that i think hey well like how far in the past can you go back can you go back to hey if my alarm hadn't gone off two weeks ago you know and i would have had stayed it slept in for an extra five minutes does that mean i don't get hit by the car or is it really just when does when does that kind of thing reset you know is it a daily thing or is it just since lunchtime you know <laughs> you know or is everything set in motion so far in the past so you know multiple multiple it sort of reminds me of that uh, movie. I think it was called Sliding Doors uh, with Glen uh, Gwyneth Paltrow. Do you remember that? I do, yes. You know, if, if you miss the subway, yeah. then your life goes this way. And if you make it on the subway, your life is 100% different. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's sort of the butterfly effect concept as yeah. well. Yeah. And that's actually, there's a uh, an anecdote within AA. So I'm... I'm in recovery, you know, I'm sober and uh, it's like, and the anecdote of if I never give up before the miracle happens, but the beauty of that is if you do give up, you'll never know. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, and you know, you can, you can drive yourself crazy trying to connect everything. Like if I hadn't done that, if I hadn't done this or they'd done that, blah, 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 and it's just, a, like the serenity prayer is is a wonderful thing for me it's you know and the serenity prayer is uh, grant me the serenity to accept the things i cannot change the courage to change the things i can and the wisdom to know the difference and it's i would say that's the most perfect piece of writing that there's ever been as far as a self-help guide and you know we can take away the religion we don't need to say hey god or whatever it's just like let's be conscious of accepting things that i couldn't yeah you know I, can i you know drive myself crazy constantly trying to rework something to hey oh i gotta change it, i gotta change it, gotta change it um but again the element in there that's that's the real 
kicker is the wisdom to know the difference. You know, because of course there are things that you can change and there's things that you cannot, but <laughs> how do you know, you know, can you leave things alone or can you just, you know, take yourself a bigger hole? So exactly. Yeah. My, uh, my mother, uh, you know, bless her heart. She was an absolutely unbelievable person and she suffered very severely from, from alcoholism in my youth. And uh, we we got to a point where we were able to uh, put her into a, an in-house uh, AA program. It took about six months, I think it was, um, and I could only visit her. I think it was about two hours a week. My sister and I would go, and one of those hours, they and I I know things were different, you know, back in the '80s, but we would literally go into the AA and NA meetings, my sister and I, and we would hear all the stories. And for for many many years, I uh, I, I heard that prayer. And, uh, and I had it memorized myself and it's a very powerful thing because it, it really solidifies what do you have control over? And if you do have control, then you, then you have the ability to do something about it. And if you don't have control, which is a lot of the time you don't have control over it and to not dwell on the things that you don't have control over and to not go down that rabbit hole, because that can be a very, uh, dangerous rabbit hole, mentally speaking. <laughs> Wow. So, so the age of 26, did you come directly to the States from Northern Ireland? Yes. Yeah. Um, I came, so the, the visa that I came on was, uh, specifically due to the peace process. You know, it gave the, it was kind of like a conflict resolution visa where it would take people that were directly affected by the difficulties, you know, and place them in other areas, you know, from a, from a conscious knowledge of, of giving us a better, opportunity plus you know our lived experience you know to help help others so um and it, it you know i got i got placed in boston um originally so okay so you went directly to boston and then did you go from boston to utah yes and yeah so i was an architect okay um i was an architect back in those days uh i do conceptual psychology uh, commercial interior so kind of like google offices like open plan i put a slide and bean bags and things yeah um and i did that also in 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 europe and the uk and then i did it across the east coast and i won a bunch of awards not because i was a golden child of arch ar architecture it was just uh I, i'll tell you the secret i didn't know what i was doing because i'm an engineer is my my degree is engineering and through engineering, I learned computer design. I learned 3D modeling and stuff. Uh, and that's how I got into architecture was initially to do the, like the initial, the 3D models of buildings. Uh, and it was really, cause really everything I wanted to do, I wanted to do, I wanted to be a filmmaker, but I couldn't see how to be a filmmaker, but I thought, well, it's technically making films. You know, if I can draw this building and make somebody walk around it, you know, you know, those 3D visions pre-vis of, of buildings so technically it's filmmaking so that's how i got into that but by a process of doing that you know I, I started doing actual design work as well but i was terribly shy back then i couldn't ask questions so instead of asking questions of how do you design this building how are you supposed to do this i would just come up with something cool you know i would like be ah you know and it was literally i look back and think Again, because everything's connected to film. Like, oh, what would what would this office be like if James Bond? If this was James Bond's office, how cool would it be? That's you know? awesome. I love that. Or, or also thinking, how bad would I feel if I lost my job and blah blah blah, and I end up having to work in this call center that I designed? How angry would I be if I made it if I had designed it really badly? So. So those are my two aspects, and one from the film standpoint, I hadn't really put it together that, you know, films are built on sets, you know, so they don't have, it's not a structural building, you know, so it can look cool, you know, and they have to be able to remove the walls to bring the cameras in and all these elements that, that I didn't really put together as far as a structural architectural space, but this stuff looked cool, you know? And uh, 
so in the end, a lot of the projects happened because people were interested in seeing, you know, pushing outside the box, but they were always thinking that, oh, what cool ideas you've got, you know, you're so innovative, you're really, but really the secret was I didn't know what I was doing because if I did, you know, if I had been a, uh, an arch, a, a trained architect, I would have been doing it the same way as everyone else. You know, it would have just been cubicle farms across the board, yeah. you know, or if I'd asked questions, if I'd been able to not be so shy, they would have just told me, hey, well, here, this is how you do it. But so anyway, so that's why I won these awards, because their things were different. I know? think you're being too humble, though. I, I, I bet you got those awards because you're legitimately great. I mean, you're very smart. You're very talented and you're very creative. And I'm sure they saw that. Well, 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 yeah, because in the end, the creativity came from like it wasn't from a standpoint of me sitting down saying, I'm going to I'm going to be a and I, I I hate the buzzwords, you know, I'm going to be a disruptor or I'm going to, you know, it's like, no, I just, you know, there, there was no like really trying to see, hey, well, this stuff isn't working, so I'm going to try and make it better. Yeah, it was like it was just no, this is I'd rather do something cool and fun than the standard stuff. Um, so in the end, you know, in, innovation and inspiration comes from somewhere and, and maybe that, you know, and I, I was proud of the stuff that I would do. And, and anyway, so, uh, you know, I won, I won these awards and, uh, I got sent out to Utah to do that, to do that innovative design stuff here, uh, just in, in 2008, just in time for the economy to crash. Yeah, and that was the end of that. Uh, you know, I got to do a couple of jobs here, like the Adobe building down in Lehigh, um, and like uh, OC Tanner, and just a couple of different spots. But you know, it really wasn't enough to to uh, to really stake my claim here. Right. So then, two thousand eight happened. Uh, the the whole thing uh, sort of implodes. What did uh, What did your life path? Uh, look like at that point in time what did you do um i got horrifically depressed um you know obviously the the difficulties with the ptsd and the you know the alcoholism was really taking its toll uh now i was stuck in utah and i couldn't speak the language <laughs> uh, um and so you know i just i just I just fell down. I fell down hard, and um, you know, the you know, there, there's we could talk for hours and hours of where this all came from, but but in the end, I was an alcoholic, and and I used these difficulties that I was experiencing in life to to self medicate more, to drink more, you know, which uh, just got worse and worse and worse and worse. Uh, then I ended up homeless. Um, you know, down at the road home and and, and uh, pretty rough for, for about a year to 18 months. Uh, I was I was just experience, uh, well, uh, embracing oblivion, I'll say. So. Wow, that is really interesting how you said that, embracing oblivion. Wow. Mm -hmm. Can you can you expand? I mean, I know exactly like where you're coming from on that is seemed like my mother went down that path. Um, she didn't end up homeless at any time, but that, uh, that alcoholism can be a really ravaged beast. Um, mm -hmm. what was, what was homelessness? Uh, what was that experience like for you? You know, I look back upon that as well, and I really can't connect to it. Uh, because life has really become infinitely so much better for me now and like un unrecognizable and how, how much how good it is and i look back at that time and you know it was the the the, the boozing and using you know the drugs and alcohol that you know i one i don't really remember it like i can kind of like put it into like a year and a half is a long time but not really when you're just oblivious um and you know the the other side of the coin was fear and i didn't want to be scared you know i didn't want to be scared and i didn't want to have pain um you know i haven't really experienced 
a lot of physical pain in my life, but the emotional pain, from a personal experience, I'd say, you know, that's horrifically more difficult than any physical pain. Um, you know, fair play sometime down the line, I may have some, to, uh, I'd be like, whoa, what was I thinking? <laughs> you know, I, I've stubbed my toe quite hard sometimes and that kind of like, oh man, you know, but that's only a, like a, a, it's a, it's a brief, it's, it's a brief time period. Um, but the emotional pain is, is far, far, it, you know, it just crushed me. And so again, the equation for that for me was, oh, okay, well, if I booze and use, not scared, not not in pain anymore. Um, and the simplicity of that is just, okay, I've got no booze left, need to get more. You know, and that's your function. It's just simplicity of life is, is you know, just, just the whole goal is make the pain go away. So, right. So that was it. You know, my, 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 my memory of that was just like the memory is non-existent. And really, I was just a ghost. I was just a ghost in life. So. Wow. Now, you've, uh, you've told me the story before, but could you share with us the story of what that uh, what the transition looked like and that experience that sort of sparked that that was not your path any further and that you needed to yeah. make a change? Sure. Um, so you know to, to to sort of go back a little bit so the again the the the, the traumatic experiences that i was ex having you know uh, there's all you know obviously gun violence and 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 trauma and that side of things and so you know i had multiple times where i was you know dragged out of a car and a gun to my head and and, and things like that and and of course then the uh, uh the other shootings that i experienced in the bombings and all of that so it all amalgamates into you know a, a massive traumatic memory and that traumatic memory was it was a muzzle on my forehead you know i could always feel this gun right on my forehead and still to this day i can still feel it in times of stress you know i can feel this muzzle and it's right there and, and it's so ridiculous how the mind works um, even when the subconscious is sabotaging you, you know, because we're in those times of stress and that, like, it's just, it's, it's so interesting to me that I have such a, you know, a connected partnership, I'll say with, with suicidal ideation, you know, because, you know, just, just fantasize about, anyway, fantasize about pulling the trigger or somebody else pulling the trigger to make again makes makes the pain makes the difficulty go away instead of moving through it instead of doing the hard thing to move through the difficulties uh in place but anyway so so that was my thing you know i always had this gun to my head i had this muscle on my forehead you know and i would uh, just 24 hours a day just have this ghost gun just follow me around you know and all of that difficulty and so that's why i drank you know that's why i drank and used to make that go away you know, it certainly didn't make it go away. It just made everybody else go away. It made all my friends, all my family, all my jobs, you know, everything made it all go away. And and then, uh, and then one day I was down the park, you know, just being this decrepit being, being a decrepit being, um, instead of being a decrepit doing. So <laughs> just this, <laughs> I like uh, that. Um, and uh, of course, everybody, you know, I'm just furious at the world and it's everyone else's fault. And why doesn't someone just take me away and stroke my hair until, you know, it's silly things. But you know, so nobody wants to engage with that energy, you know, and it's except for children, you know, children don't care. They just see, hey, there's someone will play with me, you know, let's engage let's be adventurous and let's see what happens over here and so there was a family having a picnic and there was uh two little five-year-old boys um i don't know if they were really five-year-old five whatever just in my thought process they were that age group and 
and they have bananas and they came up to me with bananas and they shot me with bananas because they were playing army you know shot me a banana and it triggered me of course but it, it triggered me beneficially uh so again for whatever reason uh now we're going to get into the whole aspect of tangents and how everything happens for a reason. Just as I was mentioning earlier on, hey, how far does the timer go back? But whatever reason, was this set in stone that it was going to happen at this moment? Or did I, was I just at a right spot or to be able to comprehend this? But, but whatever, for whatever reason, the idea popped into my head that those two kids are truly believing that those bananas are guns, which they are in a child's imagination. Uh, there's no reason that I can't believe the opposite is true. The guns are bananas. And I started drawing my, you know, I had a, I had an old pay slip in my pocket and uh, crayons and I started drawing all of my adverse memories, but replacing all the guns with bananas. Um, and in the beginning, it just started with stick man and started with, you know, and I would sculpt it and I would draw it. But every day I would try to draw this, you know, and, uh, and I, you know, just consciously doing that, it took away all the pain and the fear because it, it restructured and reframed my experience. Now, it didn't change my memories. Like, I was fully aware that these things still happened, but it allowed me to kind of have more power in it and, and look from a different perspective and, and, and think, hey, you know, this guy is, you know, try, uh, holding a banana to my head. You know, there's two ridiculous things about that. One, he's trying to kill me with a banana. You know, he might as well put the skin on the floor and hope that I slip on it and bang my head. Or two, the most the other ridiculous thing is he's not trying to kill Brian Higgins. You know, he's, he's trying to kill what I represent, which is his enemy, his other. So what can I do to change that, to become his friend, to become, you know, to become Brian Higgins to him? You know, I can take the banana off him, you know, and I can share it with him and I can... You know, and we can we can communicate and we can talk about you know our, our, our troubles and break down the barriers rather than just hey you represent my opposite and everyone says that you're my enemy so I'm I have to you know instead of the, the humanity and the, the connection of people so as I said it took about six months to get you know to, to get sober to get into programs to get into sustainable housing and you know, and to, to be able to start moving forward. Again, at that time, I thought, hey, I can still, I'll, I'll still be the vice president, director of multinational architectural companies. <laughs> but that, I couldn't, uh, that, that, that ship had sailed. So I had to, you know, I had to, you know, start from scratch and start rebuilding and, and you know, you know, work towards becoming, becoming a decrepit doing <laughs> um, and I, you know, and, and, and by process of that, you know, I really saw the magic in the reframing of the trauma and thinking, hey, this could, this could work for others. Uh, and I started, you know, I thought, well, let's go to the VA. Let's go up to the VA because obviously this can only work with bananas, bananas and guns. There's only, this is the magic formula. And I thought, okay, we'll go to the VA because there's, there's, trauma there there's there's gun trauma there uh and i started developing programs there and that process hey doesn't have to be guns you know it can be it can be any trauma you know it can be uh any representative stuff that we can we can change the story and and help people experience a happy ending in their stories so i started moving hey let's look at okay, ptsd let's look at depression let's look at suicide let's look at anxiety let's look at you know, and it really just morphed into all these marginalized issues, you know, from refugees to homelessness to um, to, any, to any type of, of thing. And, and I, I started my nonprofit, which is, you know, it was Create Real Change back in the days because it was like creating real change using film and creativity, uh, which has morphed into, you know, Mental Healthy Fit, which is films, ideas and tips. And it's a national nonprofit. We do events programs workshops uh to help people you know uh, have more perspective and conscious knowledge in their stories so that they can experience a happy ending and, and shine a spotlight on the shadows 
So, gosh, I mean, it's just such an inspiring story, and I appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, you know, I think it's uh, probably a good thing that when I'm sitting back here, my eyes just look like little dark uh, uh, rectangles because they were definitely uh, getting uh, welled up with uh, some tears because it's just such a heavy story. Um, so, I mean, with this, I mean, you've done film work, you've done comedy work. I mean, you're, you're, and you're involved in multiple aspects of, uh, of, of the community. What do you think is uh, some of the sort of driving factors in, in your motivation, let's say, in getting involved in all these different creative endeavors? Well, you know, the, the real foundation of it is it helps me. You know, it, it helps me stay sober. Um, it helps me, um, you know, there, there's three elements that I, that I try to do every day and it's look after myself, help others and make progress. And I tried to swap that around and I thought, well, I'll help others first before me, but then everything fell apart. You know, you got to look after yourself. Uh, it's the same old thing. Put your mask on before you help others. Uh, because you know, if you're not, if you're not on tip top form, you're not going to be able to to be good for others yep. um and really that's like i gotta like I, I genuinely believe like this is my piece of the puzzle in the grand scheme of things is to do this work you know to use my out of the box thinking and, and perspective and communication skills and um you know to help people change their stories you know not just just individual people but if we can help individual people that'll help communities and that'll help cities and towns and just help you know change the world because you know the world is certainly in a in a sorry state of affairs at the moment um and i i just for all the little pieces that i can do can maybe help shift the balance i absolutely love that i was actually having that same conversation with someone the other day um, you know, we we as humanity tend to think that, well, things outside of us is their problem or society's problem or the community's problem. But the catch is unless we internalize and look look to us first and say, well, I'm part of the community. I'm part of the neighborhood. I'm part of the family or whatever that thing is. And to do our best to try to step in and say, I need to insert myself to the best that I can to help the community and to help the world, because if we're not doing that, then we all sort of compartmentalize ourselves and we all become sort of our own private islands and we mm -hmm. can never succeed if we're all our own private islands. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. So is this going to be one of the best ways that people can learn more about Mental Healthy Fit? Yeah, yeah. Mentalhealthyfit.org is the website. Uh, you know, you can get us on there. You see all the events that we have coming up. Uh, Instagram, Facebook as well, and and you know just just keep an eye out. Like we do projects every every month, um, you know, and they're always cool, like special film events and things like that. So it's not all doom and gloom, but it's it's just cool, cool creative projects. And we have this cool thing called the Art Church, where we built a little church on the back of a trailer, and it's full of art supplies, and we drive it around uh, on the first Sunday of each month, and park it in just random parks. And people can come and do some art and mindfulness on a Sunday morning. Um, That's awesome. I didn't know about that. Yeah. Yeah. The first one we actually got is next next Friday, next Saturday, next Sunday, uh, depending when this goes out. But July 17th, um, we're going to be, it, it, we're specifically doing it for refugee art. Um, so people are, are going to learn how to, how to create, you know, Syrian, traditional Syrian art or Congolese art and things like that. So. So if you keep an eye and you can sign up for the newsletter and get invited to all of that stuff. So. That's amazing. So uh, Mental Healthy Fit is a, a registered 501c3. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And can people donate uh, directly to you? I can, yes. There's a big old donate button on the website. Uh, or you can come like come to the events and donate there, uh, you know, buy tickets to our screenings and things like that, you know. So. That's amazing. So, so I've, I've got a, a small confession and this is sort of uh, interesting. Um, so I, I bought a pair of yellow pants last year and didn't get it, get a chance to wear them. And today I thought I'm going to wear my yellow pants and I had another shirt on 
And uh, for some reason, I, I was just sort of playing around and I, I, I went into the other room and, and this is one of my, I, I just love the color yellow. And I walked into the other room and I put this on. And yes, I've got yellow pants on as well. And my, and my wife was making fun of me. I mean, playfully, of course, she's like, sure. you look like a banana. And I just, I didn't even connect the dots on that. And then all of a sudden, when I was putting together the artwork and I'm like, oh my gosh, I remember that story that you told me right before we went on um, about that. Cause it was in Liberty park, right? Mm -hmm. Wow. So I mm -hmm. just, the, the symbolism and uh, how, how the universe sort of works and connects is pretty interesting. And yes, I'll be changing my shirt. I'm not going to run around all day today looking like a banana, but. Oh, come on. Cool. But you get yourself a yellow hat and you'll be like curious George. Oh my gosh. That um, was my favorite books growing up. But they, uh, one of the things that we do is then we teach, we talk about color psychology, you know, how to use different colors to, to enhance different things. And yellow uh, promotes the use of serotonin, but it promotes the production of serotonin. Um, so, so you should always try to have a bit of yellow in your life. Um, and that's why like the, the smiley face guy, you know, the yellow smiley face emoji. Yep. That's why he was originally yellow because it was a happy, happy color to represent serotonin. So. That makes sense. And I, uh, my, my entire wardrobe used to be made up of like black and grays and, you know, just sort of dark colors. And, and it was a, it was a handful of years ago. I just said, I need to add some more color. And now it's just like, I've got like the purples and the greens. And I, I just have a, I just have a good time with, with color. And so that makes perfect sense. You know, when you're wearing yellow, it's, it's hard to be bummed out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, Brian, I sincerely appreciate your time today. Um, is there anything that uh, you feel like we may have missed that I that you think is important for for my viewers to understand about you or your organization? No, just just uh, for your own for your own selves. You know, if it's important to communicate about mental health, you know, there's there's no shame and no harm about talking about it. If you, one of my taglines is, uh, if someone seems different, find out why, and if you feel different ask for help so, simple things exactly and i and i think it's um i think it's a really great thing that we as a society are moving in a direction where um we can have more conversations around it without it being as you've stated stigmatized um because many generations have gone through the you know what we'll just sweep it under the rug and and just play like nothing's wrong and the problem is that it, it will manifest at some point whether it be you know physically mentally emotionally um, not dealing with things will manifest. It's just a matter of time. And it could manifest in a few months. It could manifest, you know, 30 years from now, but it'll come. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> so I really appreciate all the work that you do in the community, Brian. I think you're doing amazing work. Um, I've uh, been very grateful for our friendship and getting to know you more and more as uh, time goes by. And uh, you're a very talented person. I know you're, you're very humble. Um, but you're very talented. You've got a ton to give to this world and this community. And I know that a lot of people look up to you and everything that you do. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Um, is there uh, any any uh, final words of wisdom or anything else you'd like to share before I uh, put you in the green room for a few moments? Uh, everyone should go out and buy a yellow T-shirt. <laughs> Love it. And then make sure you take a selfie and tag Brian in the selfie. Yeah. There you go. Awesome. Well, I'll uh, place you in the green room for just a couple of moments while I wrap up the show, and then we'll uh, talk for just a couple of moments. Is that cool? Yeah, great. Thank you. All right. Thanks, my friend. There you go, my friends, uh, Brian Higgins. Uh, definitely check him out on social media. Um, he is uh, an absolute uh, joy to be around. He is uh, a plethora of knowledge and uh, has done some amazing work in the community. So be sure that uh, you, you check out mentalhealthyfit.org. Um, learn all about his organization, and you can donate here as well. This is a, a great organization if you're looking uh, to spend some uh, charity dollars. Uh, look at what they've got going on. So anyway, thanks again for joining us on Always the Journey TV on uh, interview number 70. Um, and please uh, subscribe to the channel. I've got a button somewhere on the screen. And also, if you enjoyed the content, please throw us a thumbs up. And if you have any questions, please throw them in the comments below. And I'm sure uh, Brian would be happy to uh, answer any questions you have. So again, thank you very much uh, for your time and uh, we'll rock and roll with our outro music. Take much care and have a phenomenal weekend.